Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. This past week has been... Trying. Yes, trying is a very good word. I, the video that went out, I think this morning, I was talking about how Samantha was sort of under the weather. She had some congestion going on and then Benjamin got the congestion and thankfully that's where it stopped with the two of them. But whatever it was, I got it and it laid me out. Like I was down and out for two full days, which is so r rare. I don't even super rare. I don't remember the last time I've been that sick. Whenever you get sick, it almost feels more like you'd classify it as like a mild cold. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, you usually bounce real fast. And like it you might be down for an afternoon or something. Maybe, but it doesn't even usually take me away from work. No. Usually I can power through, and yeah. but this one, nope. I mean, I had it all: fever, uh, like body ache, skin hurt sore throat, coughing, congestion, like everything. So hopefully I got it all done. Like all I good checked, stuff. checked all the boxes. Now yeah. I can be done for the rest of the winter. It's just so weird. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, I don't get it. I, I'm yeah. skating through so far. Yes. Well, and because I was down and out for two days, we got behind. So mm. by the time this video goes out, you will have realized that we had to skip posting on Thursday of this last week, um, just because we didn't have a video for it because mm. I was too sick to make one. Um, but thankfully I'm on the mend. You can tell, like you can tell, you can hear it, that I still have some lingering effects going on, but it's, I feel so much better. When I woke up this morning, I could actually talk normally-ish mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah. Like I was, yeah, did not have a voice, but. Well, on the bright side, we're in the Hartley. We are in the Hartley. We're entering that season where it's a lot more comfortable to be in here. Yeah, windows are open. It's an awesome day. It really is. And you guys know we have a mini split in here, so we could like run that AC unit during the summer. <laughs> and I mean, we'd have to run it to where it'd probably want to wear out yeah. to keep it cool enough in here to be real comfortable to work in. Which we really didn't do this we year. We don't. We Did we run, run it? We ran it a little bit toward the very end of the season. But, we, um, and we, I think that's fine. I think, you know, the idea is that you've got it in case you want to, you know, use it. If you if you want to come out here in the summer, you can cool it off for like point, a day or two. We did run it while the pond crews were here. Yeah, right. So that people could come in here because it's so close, you know, to where the pond is. Um, so we did run it then, but we're not using it to like make it a comfortable interior, like a home space. We just had that put in so that we could take the edge off mm -hmm. either the heat or the cold. But anyway, yeah, we're entering that season where it's just, oh, it feels so good to be out here. I love it. And the sun is out. Yeah. It feels so refreshing. Before we launch into the questions from this last week, today's recap video is sponsored by Hoselink, the maker of retractable hoses that have changed our garden. It's a great Christmas space. present idea. Yeah, it actually is. If you have a gardener uh, in your life, family, friend, um, and you need to find a gift for them, yeah, that would be a good one. Yeah. For sure. We will link them down below. You guys, they have retractable hoses in 82 feet and 50 foot lengths. I think all of ours that we have are 82. Mm -hmm. And um, they're just, hmm, they're just so nice. They also have a bunch of accoutrements, like um, ways that you can install them in the ground, like on a pipe instead of having to install them on a structure. Yeah. Um, they also have like covers for the little shroud, the hose shroud. and guides and spray nozzles. They also have a lot of other stuff on their website you could check out too. Like um, they've got lights and they've got just a lot of a, a garden. In fact, you know, they sent us out that um, that weed puller that one time. Remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was actually like pretty I useful. Used it. If you're the type of person that can't bend mm -hmm. or, you know, it's difficult, uh -huh. um, I would look at getting something like that. I used it. I remember in the big lawn when we had all of those huge goat heads mm -hmm. out there because the weeds themselves are like this big but then you know you get into the center and you just pull the little center out they were just really viney they were yeah and they had goat heads on them so mm -hmm. it was nice to get in there with that tool and not have to touch them right it's really handy anyway we will link them down below thank you hose link for sponsoring today's video first video from this past week was digging dahlias in a satisfying annual cleanup. So I started in on our dahlia digging. I got two rows done and we got them lifted. Well, the tops cut off. We got them lifted, brought over to the space by our barn. And then I hosed them all off, kind of went through them to remove any kind of potential issues. Like I did find some crown gall, which I have found in very small amounts in our patch throughout the years. Um, not 
a huge significant problem thankfully at what, this what point. What is crown gall? It's like um it's spread by it's a bacteria uh-huh. that enters and then it produces all this knobby growth and then they get like distorted growth up top and don't perform properly and there's also leaf gall too which looks like um instead of having you know really strong central stems they shoot out a bunch of almost like water sprouts. Mm. That's what you would think of when you saw them um and so they're two things that you don't want in your dahlia patch so we cull those out right away so that we're not touching tools you know and spreading stuff around when we're getting ready to clean up all the the tubers but anyway got those moved into the greenhouse so that they could dry and while i was doing that paul and bethany were cleaning out annuals which is so satisfying to watch happen and they were kind enough to set up cameras and they got some fun angles and things so that was it was awesome. fun to see the annuals get rolled up like a carpet. Yeah. And then you were working on your own project, which oh, yeah. was the deep fried turkey. Yeah. I think, uh, I think I left it in a little too long. I would rather that as a first try than having it underdone. I had, I had a dream about uh, fried turkey and I had a dream that I did it again and it tasted so good and juicy. And really? I was like, man, I need to try, try it, again. it again. Well, you know, I'll, I'll do it again. It, it kind of was a dry run anyway mm-hmm. for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, cause I wanted to, you know, like anything else you do it once and, um, pancakes, somebody told us once throw away your first pancake when you're, when you're making them. And it's so true because you learn so much from the first pancake. Yeah. You'll either underdo it or overdo it. Mm-hmm. You adjust um, the heat. And, and like, you know, what's one pan- pancake? So now I'll be a pro at Thanksgiving. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's the first uh, comments from Kelly Den. How was the turkey? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. When Aaron was saying he couldn't get the temp as high as it needed to be, all I could think about was a few Thanksgivings ago when a family member of mine was in charge of deep frying the turkey. He had the thermometer inside the turkey instead of inside the oil. By the time uh, he thought the oil got up to temp, there was nothing nothing left but skin and bones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a bummer. Oh, like a Christmas vacation turkey. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, your turkey was pretty. There is that. It looked good and the dark meat was good. Um, but yeah, I left it in too long. I think I think the problem... I think one of the problems with uh, it not getting up to temp is that it took me a long time to get the turkey in mm-hmm. because uh, it was bubbling up a lot. Mm-hmm. You know how like you put it in and it kind of starts to go crazy. And I turned the heat off because that's like the safe way to do it. You turn the heat off, you turn the fire mm-hmm. off. That way it can't, nothing can explode or the thing won't catch on fire mm-hmm. and then you turn your your heat back on so maybe i'll do it a little dangerously next time and just leave oh, the heat boy. going the whole time i saw somebody mention about keeping the heat up and putting it in a little bit more of a protected area yeah because it you wasn't were, windy though it wasn't windy but you're out like in yeah it is cold outside yeah and it was exposed it wasn't like tucked up under like a, a warmer area sure. like maybe on the south side of the house or something yeah. i don't know I don't know. You gonna do it again before Thanksgiving then? No, I'll just do it at Thanksgiving and then. Are you sure? It'll be awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh, Don Miller said, "Thanks for keeping it real, Laura, with how messy it can get." I did show because oh my gosh, when you use a jet stream and you've got your deli tubers kind of like not at face level, but at like I don't know waist to chest level, right in there. If that jet stream hits a tuber right, I mean, that water's coming straight back at your face. And I was a total mess. Yeah. Like, it was in my hair. It was all over my face. Covered the front of my clothes. I, I sh- guess I could have done it cleaner. But honestly, it was the most comfortable way to do it. And uh, that's where I'm at in life. Like, I'm going to <laughs> garden the way it's more comfortable to do it. So, um, like, if I have everything at waist height... Like, I can still bend over and all of that just fine, but I like to do, it's more pleasant. Yeah, You sure. know, so I wheeled out a greenhouse table and that was really pleasant because then I could just wheel it right back out into the greenhouse and I didn't have to monkey around with moving the dahlia clumps a whole bunch. Um, question, if you found gall, will it affect, will it affect other plants or is it only dahlias? I don't know if it'll affect other plants other than dahlias, but I do know if you find it, do not. Do not touch that affected clump to another clump. Um, you know, they can enter through injury. They can enter, they can even like infected soil can do it. So like crop rotation is the best way to eradicate it in your space, which for us, and I think I mentioned this, I'm not super worried about it. And we're gonna be planting back in the same general area, but we're moving where things are. So they're not going back down into the same exact holes um, as they have. In fact, I have been spacing them out about every 12 inches. I think I'm gonna go further because we just, like they've yeah. just been so thick um, and I just don't need like 
super productive, super full space. But one, I want more space to move around. Two, it doesn't really matter that we have like the sheer amount of blooms because we're not doing it to sell them. Um, I want the plants to be more healthy. Are we going to do anything about the roses? Oh, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> don't really want to think about that right now. <laughs> if you suspect that you might have gall in your patch and you're still like trying to go through your clumps and save what you can, just make sure to clean your cutting tools. Like when you're cleaning up the clumps and dividing, clean them between each cut if you can, um, or between at least each clump. Uh, because sometimes, like I went through mine before they even went into the greenhouse and got rid of anything that I thought was even suspicious of gall um, so that I wouldn't have that issue. But every once in a while, you might get into cutting one and dividing a clump up and think, oh, I think this one might have it. Dang it. So you immediately toss those tubers and clean your tools really well because that's what will spread them. And it doesn't automatically show up like right away. It could be a while before that uh, thing shows up, the gall shows up. Tracy said, thank you for another informative and entertaining video. Did you get around to planting cover crops? I did not. That was something that I had kind of wanted to do this fall. Uh, but you know, we're going to be moving stuff around. So, I mean, two things. One, we just ran out of time. And two, we are going to be redoing how everything's organized. Not everything out in the cut flower garden, but in a lot of the spots out there, we're going to be shifting where rows are and making things a little bit whiter. So planting cover crops might not even be worth it this, this season. I kind of need to get things set to where they're a little bit more permanent. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll ever be permanent out there we'll see you can get closer we can get perhaps. closer and closer yeah El Grillo said you mentioned that you've been putting hoses away at what temperature do you put away your hose link hoses do you do anything special when storing them for winter so that's the one thing nice thing about hose link hoses is that when you're done you just uh, detach them from like the faucet and then just lift the whole shroud like the whole what do they call it do they have a name for it the I don't know the, what they... The thing that the hose reels up yeah. into, it's the plastic shroud. So you lift the whole thing out of its little holder, and then you just put it somewhere either, well, protected. Mm -hmm. I know because where we're storing them, they can still freeze. So if there's water in them, it could still damage, do some damage. So um, we use an air compressor and just blow an air compressor through the hose, and it just removes any water. You can do the same thing by pulling the hose all the way out, making sure both ends are open of the hose. And as you reel it in, as long as the hose link is higher than your hose ends, the wa water, for the most part, will all go out of the hose. Do you know that's one of the reasons that I like hose link so much more than other brands? There's multiple reasons, but one of them is how easy it is to remove a hose link from uh, the mounting point. Yes. And you can move it somewhere else and they store so tidy yeah other brands have um like you know you can lock the hose link if you want to you can put a padlock on it but other brands have like they're they're more secure maybe you could say or at least that's the way they would say it but in my experience like it's just kind of unnecessary yeah and we just start putting ours away when the temperatures start reaching right around freezing yeah. I mean, well, not all of ours are put away. In fact, the, the frost-free hose, hose faucets out or, and about, um, most of those still have a hose link on them because I don't know what our 10-day looks like. Um, but I know up to this point, we didn't have freeze. We just had that like few days where it froze. And then I know we're getting closer to having more. But yeah, like tomorrow night we have a freeze. But boy, there's two freezes in the next 10 days. And usually it's so light it only reaches that temperature for like an hour in the morning yeah. that things don't actually freeze and um, it warms up fast enough that the hoses if they did freeze they thought super fast and were able to still use them all um, so it's just been it's been glorious yeah. my goodness i mean our lows some of them are like 38 40 42 did you see that yeah in november yeah it's what? awesome going green mom said are they uprooting the carpet of annuals or cutting them off at the ground somehow um, sometimes the roots come out, sometimes they don't. They just roll it up and pull and yank on stuff. I I don't care either way. It doesn't it'll, really matter, does no, it? No, not really. If the roots stay under the ground, um, oftentimes they're all soft and yeah. workable in the spring, and you can either remove them at that point. A lot of time I'll just aug right through them yeah. and plant whatever is going to go in there the next season. Silly Girl Lisa said, Do you think I could use seed starting pans 12 by 22 to store my dahlia tubers and vermiculite? I'm trying to use items I already own. 
Uh, you know, I would probably opt for a cardboard box. If you could find a cardboard box, I think that would be better because seed starting trays are, I don't think they're deep enough. You want to make sure whatever you're putting in them can breathe. And then also you have enough space to fully cover your tubers. So unless you're dividing them and they're just skinny little tubers and you can fully cover them, I mean, you might get away with it, but the more storage medium around them, the safer they will stay. Um, because if it's just a very thin layer, I mean, that can dry out really fast. Um, so just cut some holes in a cardboard box? Yeah, oftentimes cardboard boxes are breathable enough anyway. Uh -huh. Because, you know, the tops are like kind of loose. Be sure. It's not like airtight, like a plastic storage tub. Yeah. That would be a no-go. Um, yeah. But could you use a plastic tub if you were willing to cut holes in it? Yeah. Because that's what essentially I'm using. Right, yeah. Is a plastic tub with a lot of holes cut yeah. in it. Mm -hmm. That's why I have to use the burlap bags oh, to keep burlap. the vermiculated. And the reason, well, one, we do that because we have the bulb crates on hand. But two, um, they do hold a little better than a cardboard mm -hmm. box. Uh, because cardboard boxes, especially in our root cellar where we're having a hard time regulating humidity right now, those can get soft real fast. So if you ever need burlap bags, go to a garden center that sells concrete pieces oh, yeah. and they will have an abundance of burlap. Yes, they will. Lisa said, how many new tubers do you get off the two year plants? Was there a difference? Uh, definitely a difference in size. I'm not sure that there's a super huge difference in quantity. When I started Dahlia from seed, oftentimes like the tubers you get from them that first year are fairly small, but I mean, anywhere from five to seven, which I think is pretty good. There are some of my older dahlia clumps that I have out there. Um, when I divide those and even plant one of the tubers, I can get upwards of 10, 11 tubers, but it, di it differs depending on variety. So it's a really hard thing to peg. Like, are you going to get a whole lot more off of mm -hmm. a second year tuber? I don't know. It kind of depends on the variety. They're definitely bigger though. Jody said, do you let the kitties come in when it gets cold? No. <laughs> you know what they do? They go in the greenhouse where it's nice and warm and heated. So where the sides roll up, they're not solid so that they can roll up if they need to. Um, so there's like this little area, four different points of the greenhouse where they can slip in between the two layers of plastic and get right in there. And they sleep on the, like right now they're sleeping on the covering that I'm using on the dahlia tubers. Mm -hmm. I'll go in there at any point during the day and there's at least one cat laying on top of that dahlia they table. They have a good life. They do have a good life. I also have them set up in the barn. They never use them, but I have like the giant pet porters. Like I didn't even get cat sized ones. I got big ones and put heated Maybe beds. Maybe that's why they don't like it. I'll bet you anything the reason they don't like it is because it's big. You think so? Yeah, they probably I mean, would like not, it if it was smaller. It's not like a giant dog one, but it's like this big. Yeah. I guess I shouldn't say it's giant. They're like not tiny. Sure. But they're, because they're used to sleeping out in the, like they sleep in the, in the open. open. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So they're like this big, like definitely bigger than a cat would need. And then we put heated beds in there and I have a heated water dish that stays in there with well, the water dish now stays in the greenhouse. Um, and then we feed them twice a day up by the door of our kitchen. So they've got it made. In fact, when any of them come in, they act like... They don't know what to do. Yeah, they get crazy. Yeah. It's weird. They just start to meow and like go from room to room. Yeah. And you know what? I'm not doing the cat hair thing again. No. Uh, and the litter box. No, 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 no. Food and Word said, should we remove the tops off dahlias if we live in an area that doesn't get frost where we overwinter in the ground? I am in zone 9 through 10, Oakland, California, and not sure how to or if they need a dormancy period. That would be a really good question to ask somebody at your local garden center. I do not garden in a zone nine through 10, so I don't know what you would do with dahlias. I mean, I think it would depend on how they look too, like how the tops look. Are they gonna still produce? Like if it's warm, I, I mean, I guess it would get cool enough to where their, their productivity would stop mm -hmm. or be halted, but not necessarily damage the foliage. That's a really good question. It's hard sometimes when I, we get from time to time a question like that or a question about like a tropical plant that's zone mm -hmm. 10 or 11. And I'm like, I don't know why garden in a zone six. Right. <laughs> I guess the only thing that's close to that is the greenhouse here where yeah. I wonder what zone this would be considered. In the greenhouse? Uh, this greenhouse. Oh, this Hartley. greenhouse. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Hey, I bring one in here and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> B Coco said, how will Cheddar get out of the greenhouse? You closed and locked the door. I saw that comment quite a lot. And again, the sides are open so they can get in and out as they please. The next video was a brick border update, transplanting lilacs, prepping dahlias for storage, and winterizing the coop. 
Lot of stuff. That was a full day. So I started back here behind the Hartley to give you an update on how Pedro and his crew were coming along with the bricks, and they look so good. I'm so excited about it. Um, Then we uh, transplanted two President Lincoln lilacs out in the South Garden. I had planted three planning on planting a fourth to create kind of this curve around one of the parts of our stone pathway. And then we decided to branch off the stone pathway to go to the berries. So it kind of like moved around where I needed things to be planted. And so all of a sudden the lilacs weren't centered. And it was like one of those things that really didn't matter a ton, but visually, to you. yeah, visually it looks a lot better now. So we dug two up, scooted them over, and now the three of them look very nice and even. Uh, Then I did prep the dahlias that we had already cleaned in the video prior. Uh, So we went through and cut all the stems back down further. We inspected all the clumps. I didn't find any more gall, which was perfect. And then just removed any damaged clumps. And then I left them to dry. I was gonna start packing that day, um, packing them up in crates for storage, but I thought, you know, I've made some pretty big cuts here and I want those cut ends to heal over because that extra moisture that can make them start to rot if they don't have a chance to heal properly. And then while we were doing that, Paul and Bethany were winterizing the coop, which consists of getting all of our plexiglass sides, like the windows that were cut for the coop, run, cleaned, and then installed. So yeah, lots, lots got done. I'm kind of existing on peppermint tea at the moment. Kelly Den said, will you show us your process of training your lilacs into trees? I have a lilac and a few other small, similar shrubs I'd like to train into trees and would love to see how you do it. Yeah, I mean, we can show you as we go through and prune. Those I chose because they have like three or four or five really strong branches already. And what I, what I do is you just kind of, as they grow, you limb them up and keep the bottoms clean. That's basically how it's done. It's really simple. It doesn't matter when you trim them. Well, with a lilac, if you want to make sure that you are getting the maximum amount of blooms, you do your pruning right immediately after they're done blooming because they bloom on old wood. Mm. So it's same with lilacs and forsythias. You wait until they're done blooming, you do your pruning, and then that's it. For me, if I'm doing structural cuts because I need it to look a certain way or I want it to look a certain way, I'll prune them whenever. Lori said, what are this, the tropical looking palm plants in the background at minute 1220? Oh, those are artichokes. So those are the ones we planted out in the dirt lands. And Paul and Bethany were actually out there cleaning stuff out. And um, they asked if I wanted those removed. And I just thought, you know what? We should just clean them up and pop them out and I'll pot them. They're not even, they're just sitting exactly how they are uh, here in the studio. They're still sitting there. So I haven't planted them in their own pots. But I thought it'd be fun to just experiment and see mm-hmm. what happens if we plant them and... I don't know, they might just sit there all winter and just be good for us to plant out next year, but you know what, then you're a year ahead on the the plant. Those green globe artichokes, so let me tell you what, I mean, the cold frames are full of them and they do look like this big monster of a plant like crawling out of the cold frames. Uh, And I just thought they'd be a fun, neat texture and they definitely handled the heat. That's the other thing in the summer, those cold frames, I don't even know how hot they get. I mean, south side of the greenhouse, yeah. full sun. Pretty warm. Although the in like part of them stays a little shaded. The north side of the inside of the cold frame. Yeah, down in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. But it's pretty. But it's the pretty, back side of it. Pretty toasty, and then yeah. they've got the windows, which uh, or the lids, and those are propped up all the way. But still, I mean, they can they hold in a little bit of heat there. And so I needed something that could handle that. And the artichokes definitely did. Um, but Imagine yeah. if you left the lids down. What's that? Imagine if you left the lids down. Oh, they would bake. They would bake. Anything would bake in there, I would think. Um, so those didn't produce any fruit or haven't yet. They still look really good. Um, I planted them really late in the season, but I planted the, uh, the extras out in the dirt lands at the same time that I planted these, or maybe even a little bit after, and they produced. They produced some beautiful artichokes. So from seed, you can get fruit off of those green glo- globe artichokes the first season. And when I did that the first time in our cut flower garden, do you remember those? I had like hundreds of artichokes yeah. off yeah. of that row. I w- like that was productive. From seed, that, sing- that same year, we got hundreds of artichokes. Let's Go Travel said, can you please explain what being a member of your channel is? Over at uh, Garden Answer Facebook group, um, everybody's perplexed on what you're talking about. Nobody seems to be able to explain the difference between being a premium YouTube member and a member of Garden Answer. So you can subscribe to YouTube Premium, which 
just means that you're not going to get ads. And then you get some other features too, like um, like offline video viewing. You can like download videos for later and it gives you access to YouTube music, I think as well. And, and last I knew it was $10 a month. Um, and then being a member of our channel, uh, there's like perks involved. So like you get a little, um, is it called a favicon or a little like, like an icon next to your name, like a little flower. Oh, oh mm -hmm. um, and then also, uh, you get access to videos the night before basically. Mm -hmm. So like the video that's going to go up in the morning, uh, whenever, <laughs> whenever I upload it in the evening. So sometimes that could be like for us, I might do it at 5 PM or I might do it at 10 PM. Mm -hmm. Um, but it'll be up the night before. Mm -hmm. So you have access to that. So, um, and it just supports the channel. So I think a lot of people do it just because they feel like they're getting some benefit from the channel and they like to support. What's and, the cost difference? Oh, I think it's five bucks. So five bucks to be a member. Um, to be a member. A However, if you do it on an iPhone, it might be more. So like if oh. just know if you're on yeah. an iPhone and you go to subscribe to being uh, either to YouTube premium or to being a channel member, it could be it's 10 and five, but it could be more than those two amounts mm -hmm. on an iPhone. Mindy said, is it an optical illusion or some of the bricks wider than others? All the bricks are the same size. So definitely an optical illusion. Doctor said, sorry if it has been answered before, but how do you keep the driveway snow free in the winter? Live in Ontario, Oregon. Well. <laughs> it usually melts like same day. It's pretty rare for snow to hang around on the driveway for a long period of time. Yeah, it usually melts off of that first. I, you know, um, was it year before last that you guys swagged the driveway with mm -hmm. Christmas lights? I loved that because it was, I don't know. It kind of looked like a little bit of a runway, but it, it helped. Well, we did that because we, uh, there wasn't enough on the maple trees to, to hold on to. Uh -huh. um, you know how like when you plant a, a young tree, they kind of have these like shoots. And no side branching. And there's no side branching, so yeah. there's nothing to actually hang a, a strand on. Mm -hmm. So we opted for you know, going down was, the driveway. That was pretty. It feels like a little much to do both. Yeah. To do a swag down the driveway and do the lights right. on the trees. And I do remember one year we did some big stakes with red and white tape on the top when we didn't have a lot out there yet mm -hmm. um, because you couldn't tell where you were. There was nothing, like no trees or anything to be like, okay, I'm real close to the, the flower bed or yeah. I'm still on the driveway, not in the lawn, you know, because one winter we didn't have those autumn blaze on this side. Mm -hmm. It was just grass remember yeah so yeah you could be driving on the grass a little bit and not really realize it so right. um and then that one the first winter we were here boy that was a like throw you into we were first year in this house and like trying to get used to things on a, a much we didn't we didn't bigger have a scale truck. no we had two little cars right compact cars both of which did not do well in the snow right um and then we yeah. got like the most snow Ontario has seen in like a hundred years. <laughs> yeah. Probably a hundred years. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, I have been thinking lately about the, the dirt lands and, uh -huh. um, the green belt that I kind of want to create. And I was thinking, um, I was Googling a lot of photos of green belts and it seems like a paved green belt is like the nicest looking thing. Uh -huh. And you know, it's only like 10 feet wide, maybe, or something like that. But, um, so if we were to pave that, I think that would be really cool in the end, but then also paving the driveway. And I would love to have a snowblower and actually snow blow the driveway if mm -hmm. it was paved. You can't really snow blow it if it's gravel. You've tried. Caitlin Kelly said, thanks for teaching me so many helpful things. Can you please tell me what would happen with your Dahlia tubers if you replanted them next year without dividing? Um, if you go too long without dividing, your plant starts to get weaker. Um, it just, it's good. It's good for plants. It's kind of like with perennials, you know, or perennial grasses. If you have a perennial grass that you haven't divided in a long time, oftentimes they'll just start growing out like a ring. Mm -hmm on the outer part and the interior dies. Um, sometimes your perennials are st start flopping over. They get a little bit weaker. So, you know, you can get away with it for a little while, but not for too long. It sounds like the Thanos paradox to me. It's like, if you don't thin, the whole thing will end up dying. Well, <laughs> let's move on to the next question. Olive said, we know your kneeling pad was a gift, but where can we find that? They do not make them anymore. That's why when I received it, I was like, well, okay, so we've actually been doing, we're trying to, to make, <laughs> we're trying to make a kneeling pad 
that we can sell on our website that is that same one. And we've been working with Tomico to do that because they were the company that yeah. made it because mm-hmm. we thought, well, they were making the first ones. And there's something in the, like, the mixture. Um, the coating on the, the outside. Coating. It was like a PVC uh, yeah. thing that... Like, I don't know if the EPA said you can't use that anymore or, or whatever it is, but you, you're not allowed to sell it in most of the states in the United States. So they had to change the, the coding, you know, whatever that is. So we're still working on it, but it, I don't know if Tommy Co. is going to be the company that gets us there. Um, so there's we're nothing on it. quite like that one. There's no kneeling pad on the face of this planet I have used that's so as good as that one. What is it about that kneeling pad? Is it the size or is it the fact that the whole thing is dipped? The whole thing feels good. Like it's the size. Cause it m- is the biggest one. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you can get the big cushy ones from, you know, other places. Um, but yeah, the coating all on the whole handle too, it makes it feel really sturdy and strong. Yeah. Because I've noticed that, that um, it's it's really common that what they'll do is they'll coat the top and the bottom and then they'll they'll cut out, you know, yeah. the kneeling pad. And so the edges are very rough. Yeah. And I think that's part of the thing that you don't like. Yeah. I just, I'm such a tactile person. And if I touch and feel something and it feels good, I'm like, yeah. yes. That's a legitimate thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you feel good about the products that you own, if yeah. they feel good in your hand, then it makes you want to use them. And it might be subconscious or subtle, mm-hmm. but it's it's worth it to you know to have the products well, that you like. You've seen how much I've used that kneeling pad, like yep. just since I've got it. When I don't use kneeling pads right. up to the, I mean, I've got a stack of kneeling pads right. in the barn, and I just rarely get them out because I just uh, I'll just get by without it. And now I'm like, where's my red kneeling pad? And nobody else better use it. Like I <laughs> I keep it under lock and key in our studio. Like yeah. it is my kneeling pad. <laughs> um, and I will not put it in the back of a truck this time. Yeah, like so it's going to stay out. here. Yeah. That's what happened with my last one. Well, if you uh, are out there and you make kneeling pads and you want to help us make <laughs> make that kneeling pad. That exact kneeling pad. <laughs> let us know and yes. we'll, uh, we'll do business. Okay. Next video is last tree load for 2023. Can you believe we were able to even go out and do that in yeah, November? Yeah, it's crazy. We went to Jaker. We took um, an it was like an afternoon, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Late morning, afternoon, um, and we went and just walked to the yard. And it started to sprinkle like right when they were loading us up. Yeah. It started to rain, and it started to rain quite a bit on our way home. When we were unloading, once we got home, it was raining at a pretty decent clip. Yep. Um, so it all worked out perfectly. But we picked out ten evergreens. When we were there, we got three Hollywood junipers, three Vanderwolf pines, two blue Atlas cedars, and two Leyland Cypress and they're all gorgeous. So we've got all of them in the ground now while you and Paul do other than the three Hollywood junipers. We did not do those that day. They're still sitting out there. We got to go get them. They're just like perched out in the the middle of that pasture. Amy Deeds said, fabulous drone shots. Love the overhead view of the fall color. How did you get the shots of you driving in? Can you fly the drone while you drive? I don't know much about drones. You know, um, there are just some things that some people are extra talented in, and maybe this is one. <laughs> I was driving the truck. <laughs> I drove the truck while Aaron flew his drone. Uh, so we, we switched twice. The yeah. first time I was like, Laura, get in the truck, um, and I'm going to fly the drone. And then so you drove us out, and then uh-huh. you pulled over like a mile away. Yeah. Because <laughs> you would prefer that I drive the rest of the way. Yeah. Um, and then With the trailer. right before we got to Jaker, we did the same thing. Yeah. We just pulled over and I hopped in the driver's seat and pulled yeah. us in. Uh, Stacy said, I know you guys get these for your business, but what would a 10 mature tree load cost? I know it's not writing stone, but just trying to set my budget for my dream. I, um, didn't, I don't know. That load specifically, I would, I would guess, um, if you, okay, if you're, cause you can't get them from Jaker. You, you have to go through a garden center, a garden center or a landscaper or a landscaper. So four to five thousand dollars is my guess yeah that's my guess for that load for real retail cost mm-hmm. yeah uh linda said if you were approached by the people who picked the tree that does up in the rockefeller center at christmas time would you entertain the offer oh to pick <laughs> the tree that goes up in rockefeller center would you entertain the offer like driving around and finding the one that might be kind of fun but then you'd have to fly all the way over there You'd have to get on a plane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything no. that requires getting on a plane, Laura's like, I'm out. Yeah. Mm-mm. Uh, Kathy said, nice trees. Are you going to be leaving room for your possible barn and horses? Yep. 
<laughs> yes, we are. User said, can you tell me where you purchased your big garden statues? I can't seem to find them anywhere. I would want them to be five to seven feet. So many of the garden statues that we have here were here from the previous owners. They left them, which is just so phenomenal because they really did have some beautiful taste in things. So our big angel statue, the Hebe under the weeping willow, Persephone up in Versailles, and then that big urn with the lions. I think those are maybe the only four that are remaining. Mm -hmm. Um, those four were here when we moved in, and we haven't moved them not a single inch. They have just stayed right where they were when we moved in, and I have no plans on moving them. But if you are looking for big garden statues, try Unique Stone. They've got some big ones that are beautiful. Um, try uh, Henry Studio. They've got also got some big ones. In fact, I think Hebe came from Henry. Mm -hmm. I think Persephone did, and I think the lions or the ram's head urn came from Henry too. Chances are what you're going to need to do is go to a garden center that one, either already sells them or two, uh, is willing to like meet the minimum, mm -hmm. uh, you know, order requirement. So they'll, they'll order your piece for you, but then they're also going to have to, you know, I don't know what the minimum is, like $2,500 or. Yeah. Oftentimes a garden center will meet a minimum to get a big statue in like that though. I yeah. know my mom does it all the time. Yeah. She's like, oh, we could use some more stuff around here. If you want this or that, you know, we'll right. build an order around yours so we can get it in for you. Yeah. I know we've got some pots coming from Unique Stone, I think, this month for yeah. around the brick patio area. Well, that would be nice. We need to get those other boxwoods in. Yeah. Do we need to order some more boxwoods? I do have them ordered. Okay. For spring. I mean, we can plant the ones we've got to finish the I feel like I need side. to make you a list of the areas that need to get buttoned up, like in front of the house. I, I, it's funny I think how I you... do recall at the beginning of me being sick, you were like, hey, if you're kind of down and out today, I can give you some stuff to work on where you could just sit there. I'm like, uh, <laughs> like totally sick and fever. No. <laughs> yes. No, you weren't, you weren't, uh, you weren't that bad. You were just kind of like, I don't really feel like, I think you were just not looking for like physical labor. No, that's the afternoon that I went upstairs and I was just like, I couldn't even. I, oh, maybe I, mean, I didn't know how bad you were at that point. But it is true that like on the other side of the business that like people don't see is all the planning that uh, goes into. Planning is the worst, you guys. I just hate to plan. Yeah, you do. And somebody has to do it. And so I feel like I'm the only one and I'm constantly bringing like, I'm like A, B. A, B, and you will not give me an answer. <laughs> because I cannot be forced. Uh, yeah, but it's like, but we can't move forward with projects unless you choose, like either I have to choose it or you have to choose it. How many times have you told me though, I'm kind of thankful that this or that didn't happen because of X, Y, Z. Like, I'm glad it didn't move forward as fast as it could have. You've said that to me a I bunch of times. I have said that before, but that doesn't mean that I appreciate things going slowly. <laughs> well, that's, it's good some of the time. I feel like we're making good progress in the Dirtlands. Yeah. With that uh, that border, mm -hmm. we're, I think we're making really good progress. Yeah, we really are. Uh, Jazz and Jamie said, "Is planting during or before frost slash freeze risky? We're in zone four B, and our landscapers advise us to wait until spring twenty four. Well, they would for sure because if they're going to be on the hook for the plant, if it doesn't, you know, a lot of landscapers will yeah. guarantee. It also depends. Like in our area, it doesn't get that cold that quickly for us. Generally speaking, you know, like." In November, it's not like we're just going to plunge into the Arctic, you know, temperatures. Yeah. Whereas, it, depending on where you live, you might, you know, uh -huh. it might get really cold really fast and then stay freezing for months. Mm -hmm. So for us, I think it's less risky. The And I think I meant, maybe I mentioned this, not in this video, but when we planted them, that the professional growers in the industry will tell you to plant six weeks before your average first frost date. They don't go by that, though, let me tell you. Um, but that's the least risky, so your plant has a chance to root in and you know has the best start. Uh, we plant as long as we can dig holes, generally, um, unless we know in the forecast we've got something that's really, you know, a cold front coming in. I think plants are better off, like if you've picked stuff up late in the season on a clearance sort of situation, I think they're better off in the ground than they are in their containers, for sure. But you do have to remember to keep watering them. If you've got long, dry, cold, windy spells in the winter, I think that's where your risk comes in more than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, Cheryl said, why didn't you guys put a tarp over the trees? Because they're evergreens. They still can get burned. Yeah. I think some was, of our Siberians did. It was did. raining, though. It was. It was like the we best. Didn't, we didn't bring a tarp, so we weren't. No. 
we went fairly slow on the way home and having that rain really does help too yeah. colder temperatures i took back roads um all the way except for i did have to take a little bit of freeway mm -hmm. and but you i was really slow i was going pretty slow yeah even then i think people understand when they see what you're carrying they're like oh yeah they gotta go slow yeah they're probably wondering why are they on the freeway <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but the, yeah, there's one little stretch where it's just way more convenient to get on the freeway. Sister Shirley said, Laura, were you able to stop for lunch? We were. We actually came all the way back to town, and we went to a local Mexican restaurant that actually our neighbor, who lives in this big old house right over here, they own it. Um, so we went there for lunch, and it was really good. Tina said, I'm curious how the Hollywood and Leyland do with heavy snow. Would they break easy under extra weight? Ours have not proven to be weak that way. I mean, I would think that our Leyland up here, the great big one that we have, would have succumbed to the 52 inches of snow we got. It's a zone six, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, your parents have like 15 of them. Yeah, they've got a lot out big of their ones. house, yeah. And notice that your parents limb theirs up. Yeah. Off, uh, probably because you're, I think your parents planted stuff maybe too close together for their mature size. Well, that's something that we're doing a little bit. Yeah, we are. Because you keep telling me, like, we need to plant close together, yep. like, you know, we see out there, because that's kind of what we want. We want the cozy well, block. Well, however, though, it does depend on where you're planting things close together. Like, I think where we're doing it, it's not going to be encroaching on, like, walkways. Whereas if you plant something right next to a, a path, then you you just have to live it up. Because, like, you but need I love room that. Like their Leyland's by the swimming pool, like where the grass kind of goes down uh -huh. into the area around the bottom. They've kind of got them limbed up to where it's like a little bit of an arch. Yeah. You know, it's kind of this magical, yeah. I love that. Uh, Madeline said, can climbing roses perform well with two to three months of shade in the, wi in the winter? Yeah. I planted climbing roses along a trellis that most months of the year has full sun. Realizing now that during the winter, the area gets full shade due to the way the sun rises and sets. That's totally fine. They're dormant in the winter. They're not utilizing the sunshine. So as long as they get sun in the, you know, when they have leaves, then they should be fine. The only thing that I would consider or that could be a consideration is that when you've got a spot that's in the shade all the time in the winter, it tends to be the coldest spot in your yard. And some roses are like a zone six or, or so depending on your zone, you might consider planting something that's really tough in an area like that. I know our, in our South Garden, the, the space right next to our neighbors where they have that beautiful bank of pines and uh, linden trees, that in the wintertime, because the sun goes down further this way, it casts a shadow that pretty much stays mm -hmm. in the entire winter. In fact, that little area up there turned into kind of an ice skating rink this last year and Benjamin and I, We'd go out there and just like skate with our shoes on, on yeah. that ice patch. It made me want to make an ice skating ring, remember? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, where could we do this? Where could we build one? And then and I started like, looking into like big ones. Oh, geez. I just wanted to like get a hose out quick and just yeah. fill up a little space. <laughs> okay, so next video is helping decorate for Christmas down at the garden center, usually one time at least during the Christmas season as preparations are beginning for the Christmas season. I am able to go down and help with at least a tree or two and we had a really fun day. I didn't make it there until like later in the day, like it was late morning. So given that, I feel like we got a lot done for that amount of time. Colleen said, is their website Love the Emerald Green Decorations? Yes, andrewseed.com, and I do know that they have some of their uh, ornaments on their website already. Paul said, you all did a great job. Everything looks good. Thank you. I have to ask, will you be decorating your yard at your house? Would love to see a video of all that. Um, we are going to be decorating, or I mean, putting Christmas lights out and so on, uh, but it's not going to be... I feel like people need to prepare themselves for a year off. <laughs> Well, I don't think so. I'm so excited. It's going to be so beautiful and so... Like, but a lot less lights. Well, our Way lights, less lights. Our lights were getting to be a bit, like, a, a bit much. Like maybe obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I like it when it's got... There's a definite plan. And we were getting to a point where it was just like, what can we drape lights on? You well, know what I mean? And I want to I want to get back to that because I really did enjoy it. I just want to wait until we have a, a gate because you know when you put that many lights out it's it beckons people to come see it and we want to be in control of when we let people through yeah you know sure well, so like if sense. we maybe um if we had a night where we could advertise like people can drive through or something like that mm -hmm. we'll have hot cocoa we can pass into people's cars <laughs> as they're going through or something i don't know i think this will be a lift list year we won't run to lift this year right We'll try not to. I don't know how we're going to get them. We still want to get them on the barn. It's just that one peak, isn't it? Yeah. 
Maybe we can get like a really tall ladder or something. Maybe. If somebody was on one side of the barn on the tractor with a rope, and then somebody else was over the top of the roof with the rope tied around their waist. My aunt, uncle and my cousins did this once. So it was like counterbalance. Oh, yeah. So the person can scramble around on the roof and get whatever done. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they were, <laughs> they were fine. Maybe. <laughs> We won't do that. L. Bernsey said, love this style of video. Can you introduce us to the birds at Andrews? I can try next time we're down there, for sure. I haven't really thought about doing that. Susan Markison said, what is the bright green plant on the table at 1217? That is a type of philodendron, and maybe we can just put the botanical name on the screen because, I don't know, it's Prismacolor Warza Whiskey, a snowflake leaf philodendron. Donna said, your mom has great taste in buying for the store, a lot of lovely goodies. How's your mom's renovation coming along at her home? It's coming right along. She's been posting some pictures on their Andrew's Seed Instagram um, recently. It's going to be so light and bright in there, so much more than it used to, because where they added on, it was where the deck used to be. So basically, they just encompassed the deck into mm -hmm. the house, and then they're building a new deck off of that. Um, but where that is all going in, it's all doors and windows, like the whole thing. There's a very little wall space, so it's going to seem more conservatory-esque. Um, and I think it'll be very, oh, it'll be so nice. And honestly, for us all getting together, there are 12, I think, of us. Mm -hmm. And the family is pretty much set at 12. I don't think anybody's planning on having any more kids or any of that business. But the kids, the kids grow. I mean, they take up more space. And things are getting a little bit tight. You yeah. know, when we needed to get in around the dining room table, we always made it work. But like the people in the back corner, if they needed something, somebody else had to get up and go get it for them because it's just too hard to get in and out. Um, so now there's going to be a nice big spot for a nice big dining room table. It'll be much more open concept. Um, before, it was like little spaces kind of connected by doorways. But um, this way, it'll just be a little bit more open so it's going to be nice uh, but it's not going to be done in time for thanksgiving which uh that's why we're hosting yeah so it should be interesting melinda d said i just love your building any idea what the age of it is you know i'm not sure how old the building itself is i know that andrew seed moved into that building in 1923 the business started in 1919 moved in 1923 and it's kind of been like added on to cobbled a bit. Yeah, big time <laughs> cobbled together. Yeah. Brian and Tammy Olson said, okay, this gets me in the spirit. I want to ask if the Christmas open house is open by invitation only, or can anyone attend it? I think once you mentioned it was for regular customers only. Nope, anybody can attend it. It's just like, it's regular business hours, um, and it's just an open house. It's more of a festive time where there's treats and goodies and um, drawings. It's probably just that uh, the regulars... Are, are aware like if you're on their email list and stuff mm -hmm. like that like you wouldn't necessarily know about it until unless you were a regular customer they do send out like a, a flyer to the people on their list mm -hmm. um and, it, and they post about it and uh you know it's been the the friday and saturday prior to thanksgiving for as long as i can remember it's always been set on that same weekend the last video is planting the big trees and packing dahlias for storage. So Paul and Aaron planted all seven of these trees after we placed them. And then while they were doing that, I got to pack dahlias, which was much easier for sure. Um, but yeah, it was a busy day. Billy Buff Buffalo said, when are you planning on removing the fence between these two properties? It was the last thing you did on the North Garden and you acted surprised it made such a difference. Moving the fence between these two properties. The dirt lands and yeah well it's possible that might be pasture so i don't really want to remove the fence for now yeah <clears throat> i mean we just paid to put that fence in too so yeah <laughs> um yeah like the fence behind the trees where we're planting the trees definitely is going to stay because that's the one between us and our neighbors um the one i guess between the south garden and the tree it just look, would look weird yeah we'd have this strip of grass with trees and then like nothing to the pasture yeah. it wouldn't connect right. we, we need to just like come up with firm plans on exactly how the space is going to be right. used and, and right. everything yeah at that point i think we'll be able to make a much better decision yeah on the fence you've talked about fence removal though in a few different areas but yeah again i think it, it we need to wait and make sure some things are solidified first yeah you we... just want to make sure that you know how things are going to be used before you go haul off and because it's you know really expensive to put it back back up yeah <laughs> 
Uh, Cheryl Moore said, if you could plant only one crab apple, what type would you plant? I have a small space and would like to add one or two to the landscape. You should plant an Indian magic. My in-laws, so Aaron's parents, Paul and Sue, they planted an Indian magic crab apple out their back dining room window. And that tree has brought so much joy, not only to them, but to me. When um, my father-in-law, Paul, he texts me pictures of it throughout the year, and I just have adored that tree so much that I put one in on, in the South Garden, and I'd love to have some incorporated in the dirt lands. But I can't remember how big exactly it gets. It's not a, ma a massive one, though. Um, and that's one of the things I love so much about it. And it gets beautiful pink blooms in the spring and let's see 15 to 20 feet tall and wide so it's kind of like a medium sized tree it gets um, these berries on it the showy berries that are persistent so they don't fall off until new growth pushes them out which is never a problem because the birds usually clean them up so they're really good for wildlife they're just a beautiful multi-season interest tree Kristen Adams said where can I buy these crates I know they come with large bulb orders but can you just buy the crates I think you can buy something similar like staples don't they have those like little, there might be a little smaller. Does Home Depot have something like that? Probably. I would check with your local box store like that, like home improvement store or Staples. They're really handy. They really are. I mean, once you get those, like you want to hold on to them. Yes, you do. Miss Flores said, quick question. How do you conquer the heebie-jeebies when you see bugs? I love the outdoors, but I do the dance when I see something crawling. I don't, I just don't have that part that, that wasn't put into my makeup when I was <laughs> formed. Um, I don't really get the heebie-jeebies about much. No. Yeah. So I'm not sure how to, and what would you do? I, it's, yeah, it's in your DNA or in your upbringing. One of the two. I think maybe kids that are, you know, with upbringings where they're like encouraged to be down in the dirt and playing with bugs and roly polies and, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Kids were out you're... petting spiders the other day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're jumping spiders and daddy long legs. Yeah. Yeah. Susan Minish said, do you have all of your dahlias dug now? I didn't, uh, just didn't hear you say, no, they're not all dug yet. Paul and Bethany dug a row yesterday. So we're just working on it in little bites. Thank the Lord it's so favorable weather-wise um, because it's nice just to get a row dug cleaned and put, oh, in fact, I think Paul's, that's what that noise was. Paul's cleaning another row. Oh. And back there bethany's out there too yeah so you know if they're done a little bit at a time then it's not it's not that terrible of a job it's only terrible when you have to do it all at one time uh, and then you're under the gun because you can't let them sit in the greenhouse for too long they start to desiccate pretty fast um you, you have to be on it so if we have just a little bit at a time then we can get them processed and it's not this huge stress but so that would be i think we've got five rows done now so there's just uh, one long row and one short row left. Not too bad. Uh, Amandina said, do you wish your cellar could be bigger? Yes and no. I mean, I feel like Paul's been building a, like a custom shelf in there because before we have those bulb crates, which are awesome, but they're stacked seven, eight deep, you know, with dahlias. And when you need to go in there and check on your dahlias during the winter, which you should be checking on them at least once a month, uh, to check that bottom crate, what a pain, because they're not super light and there's not a lot of room to move in there. So um, I asked him if he could build some sort of shelving unit that would fit like just two. Have two, you looked at it yet? No, not yet. Oh. So two could stack on top of each other, but no more than that. And so that there would be shelves to where there'd just be two, 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 you know, so it'd be a lot easier. I don't know. Yeah. You know, if we were going to redo it, um, I think having a taller ceiling would be helpful too, really? where you could stack a little higher and then have a little uh, like step ladder in there. Uh huh. And I think having a bigger space would have well, made think, more sense. I think people would argue at most cases you wish that everything was a little yeah. bigger because you'll fill up a space. Yeah, our neighbor mm -hmm. told us when we were talking about getting a tractor the first time, uh, he was like, get one size bigger than whatever you need. Whatever you've decided you need. Like if you've made the decision, bump it up. Yeah. If you can afford it. Yeah. And he was right. We ended up having to bump up like the next year yeah. had to sell that one. And luckily with the prices of tractors and stuff, it, it worked out yes, to where it, it wasn't did. a big deal. But um, it's true. Yeah. Lisa said, are you thinking about transplanting any of the tiger eye sumacs to the new property or AKA the dirt lands? I think that'd be beautiful. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. It'd be free. Yes, it would be free. And they grow pretty quick. Yes, they do. Yeah. That would be a great idea. 
Tina said, if I could grow a dahlia in a pot, could I just cut it down and take the whole pot into the basement? Yes, yes you can. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, do make sure that you don't let that soil get like bone dry. You want to make sure you still keep a the, like, the tiniest bit of moisture. Might not be an issue at all if the humidity stays high enough in the area you're storing it. You might not ever have to add moisture, but it's just something to think about. There's a fine line though. Don't, don't add too much because they can rot easily too. Dahlia storage is kind of a... It's a science a bit. Tina Marie said, thank you for always sharing your garden with us. I have learned so much and actually started gaining confidence in my own garden from watching you. You mentioned that you might have a giveaway of dahlias. Yes, can you elaborate more on that? Um, well, we will be doing a giveaway on dahlias for sure. We're gonna be eliminating a bunch of varieties that I have previously grown just because I'm ready to start with some new ones. And also because we're going from seven rows down to five um, at the most. I mean, we might just do four rows. Um, there's just no reason why I should have seven rows out there. And it's just, uh, they get too big and it gets to a point where you can't even walk the rows. So anyway, I'll have all of these dahlia extra dahlias so we'll figure out something i just figured that we would store them for everyone because i don't know how shipping would go right now anyway especially to areas that are freezing i'm not yeah. going to heat back them no way so i think we'll wait until next season and then i'll pull out anything that's still viable looking good next year that's what we'll give away um is samantha feeling better she is feeling a lot better for sure uh, Miss LeBron said, do you split your tubers? I see others do it. I was wondering if by splitting them, it makes a smaller flower. Nope, doesn't do anything to the flower. I will be splitting mine or dividing them in during the winter months, winter slash early spring, when it's still too crummy to work outside, but it gives me something to do in the greenhouse. Um, and yeah, that's when we'll be doing it. And that is the last question for this morning's recap. So thank you guys so much for bearing with this today. I know it's kind of hard to listen to. I'm doing fine. I'm like on the uptick here and I'm gonna get out and do a little bit of garden work this afternoon just to be in the fresh air. Um, and thank you Hoselink for sponsoring today's video. We really appreciate it. And we will see you guys in the next one.